Hey everybody, this is Dave Dugdale, learning DSLRvideo.com, and in this video I'm going to be doing a shootout of four different wireless microphone systems, typically referred to as ENG style, where you have a very small unit transmitter uh, on your body and then a receiver small unit attached to your camera. And the four that I'm going to be doing are the Sennheiser EW112-PG3. I think most people refer to it as the G3 and then the Sony UWP-V1, the Shure FP, and the Asden 330LT. All right, first off, I wanna tell you guys I am lazy. I don't like doing dual system sync sound. Basically what that is, is if you record audio with your camera, like your DSLR, and like a portable device like a Zoom H1, for instance. And then you sync them up in post. I'd rather not do it. Step, just skip that step all entirely. So what I like to do uh, with these wireless microphone systems is plug them directly into the camera and see how well they do with the preamp that's it built into the camera. Because the, the DSLR preamps um, are typically, the Nikon and the Canon side are pretty terrible. When you raise them up too high, they're just very noisy. So I'd write like to do is not raise them up at all, just maybe one step above the lowest level and you get a nice clean input. So what I'm looking for in these wireless microphones is a very loud or strong signal, a line level signal out of the receiver into the camera. So it's really important that I set up the gain structure correctly from the, the preamp that's built into this particular microphone and then get the audio level as hot as I can out of the receiver into the camera. All right, I know you guys are gonna say, hey Dave, these four microphones you're, set, you're testing are pretty darn expensive, and they are. Um, there could be as much as the Rebel that you bought or a lens that you bought. And yeah, they're expensive, but um, like myself, I've saved up for them. I'm gonna buy one of these four, and I think they're a really good investment. All right, one of the first things I wanted to do is kind of get the skein structure uh, of all four microphones somewhat equal. Um, I use pink noise on my iPhone, pretty much the same distance away from my mouth as I did on the, the microphone. And what I did is basically just uh, ran them through a bunch of different tests. And I noticed something really odd on the, the Sony that the other ones weren't doing. Um, I, I thought it might have been a kind of a transient peak type thing. So I played the piano, which has very high transient quick peaks, but that was an issue. And then I tried doing some sine wave, uh, pure tone, 1K test on it as well but I wasn't really seeing anything there. But then when I went back to pick noise, and this time what I did is basically just brought the iPhone from the speaking level, you know, distance from the mouth, and I brought all the way into the microphone, like touching the microphone. So the speaker and the microphone were like right next to each other. And the Sennheiser reacted exactly the way I thought it would. As you bring it in, it got so loud that it just started to distort. The same thing with the Shure and the Asden. But when I got to the Sony, as I brought it closer and closer, the level kept kind of pushing itself down and there was definitely some limiting and compression going on, at least 12 dB as I got all the way in. So to me, that means, you know, I went and looked at the manual and I'm like, there's gotta be something in here about this, but they don't talk about it. And it's actually kind of a neat feature because if you're in the situation where you got a CEO that did the microphone test and he was talking kind of, you know, low, and then all of a sudden he gets very animated during his uh, speech, you can't go up to the transmitter and change the level, it's impossible. So it's actually a good thing. But on the flip side, it actually can be a bad thing if you can't turn it off because if you're setting the level too high, what's gonna happen is all your peaks are gonna be compressed down and then everything else like um, rustling of your clothes or just the exhale through the, the nose pointing down at the microphone if you breathe really loud, um, just that air can hit the microphone. You're going to hear all those different things because you brought the level up so high and then it's squishing down the peaks. This is where I say the exact same thing four times so you can hear the audio quality difference. This is where I say the exact same thing four times so you can hear the audio quality difference. This is where I say the exact same thing four times so you can hear the audio quality difference. This is where I say the exact same thing four times so you can hear the audio quality difference. So the next test I did, I wanted to see how noisy each unit was. So I ran a noise test, basically with no signal, and take a listen.
So from that test, I think the Shure actually did the best, and then the Sony and the Sennheiser pretty much tied, and then the Asden was in definitely last place. Now at this point of my testing, I pretty much gave up on the Asden because it was so bad. No matter what I tried, if I went out of the headphone output and I hit the, the preamp harder, uh, on the Canon and I brought the level all the way down or if I used the microphone output and brought the level up to like 23 steps on the Canon um, I still got the same amount of noise. It was just terrible. And one of the reasons I tested this microphone is because the digital rev guys, Locke and um, Kai, use this microphone system like all the time. And I've gone back and listened to some of their, their uh, videos and you can kind of hear the noise, but a lot of times they're on the streets of Hong Kong. I think that's where they're at. And they've usually have some background music, which hides a lot of this, um, this background noise. So at this point, I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't stand, you know, and I would have loved the Asden to win this competition because it offers a really unique situation where you can have two um, transmitters and one receiver on the camera so you could have two people talking on camera and it would work really well so I was kind of disappointed but I kicked it out of the competition so next up I wanted to run a couple of distance tests this first one I'm going to show you is in a kind of a, a not a very heavily populated or RF area uh, a lot not a lot a whole bunch of RF frequencies going on I just wanted to see how far it could go and pretty much the Sennheiser one at 110 yards did quite well. Um, pretty much it got to go all the way to the other side of the football before it, field before you could hear it cutting out, uh, dropping out. And then the, right, the Sony ready? came in at around 100 yards. You could hear it starting to hear it um, drop out there. And then the Shure uh, started there dropping out around 40 yards. Um, I will tell you, I've, I'm doing it in a lot of different environments. Like right here, um, I tried the Sony earlier and where I've had absolutely no trouble with the Sennheiser here in this particular um, place I'm shooting, um, I was using the uh, Sony a, a little bit farther where I'm at right now, maybe 60 feet, and it was starting to drop out. So, um, so far, the Sennheiser has been the clear winner for that particular distance test. Next up is the close rustling test, I'd call it. Basically, sometimes you wanna hide a microphone underneath your shirt or lapel, and when you get two pieces of clothing just kind of rubbing against each other, you're gonna hear that sound. So, um, so I'm gonna do it in my office and have a listen. So basically what I heard was that the Sennheiser and the Sony pretty much tied for first place and the Shure sounded like it had a bit more rustling noise, especially in the higher frequencies. All right, the next test is the wind test to see how good the windscreen is. Um, I thought I might do it out here next to the, uh, there's actually a testing facility here because it's so windy in Colorado that tests these wind turbines. But I decided to do it in my office because um, I could have the exact same speed of wind hitting the microphones. So go ahead and listen to the results of these tests. So as you can probably hear, the Shure and the Sony did the best in terms of wind noise and the Sennheiser came in last. But the Sennheiser's windscreen is probably the smallest one there is and it's makes nice because it's very discreet. But what you could do is just buy an aftermarket windscreen. Um, I found some on B&H uh, that could definitely help with that. All right, now we're at uh, Civic Center Park and my friend James Drake from 5K Insights helping me out with a few tests. Uh, we did some distant tests uh, earlier. Um, and James walked backwards and forwards and uh, with all, a lot of different uh, wireless microphone systems to see which one could go the farthest. Yeah, so that's my super boring story about audio. I don't know what else to say about it other than uh, if you have to shoot in the ocean, I can keep going if you want across the street. All right. Apparently the Sony has incredible range. <laughs> Something happens, like she rides the microphone. The Sony did quite well. Actually, it came in first in this particular environment because we're in the downtown uh, Denver right now. I mean, this is, I guess, RF-wise, is probably the bad, the worst you can get, right? Yeah, I mean, outside of like LA or something like that. <laughs> That's true. 
So next up, we wanted to talk about um, construction quality and some thoughts about all the three ones that are left because I kicked out the Asden earlier. Um, so first up, we're going to talk about the shore. Um, overall, what do you think construction-wise on this one? Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit partial to the, the G3s myself because that's what I've the used. The Yeah, yeah. I've used those for like a couple of years, and they're just... Uh, well, anyway, we're talking about the shore right now. I don't know that I really am a huge fan of the, the build quality. Uh, just a little bit plasticky. And yeah. And they're a little bit large, I think. Yeah, a little larger than the Sennheiser and the Sony, for sure. Um, one of the things I don't like um, is this, this type of connector. I forget the actual name of it. It's like TA3F or something like that. But let's say you had to go and replace this sucker. Um, it's going to be hard to find. But if you go to Radio Shack, all the other ones have this type of connector, the eighth inch mm -hmm. um, connector, which is really nice. So connector wise, eh, on that one. The other uh, piece that you had mentioned earlier is the gain adjustment is this like thumb screw, I don't even know what you'd call this, a manual dial that you have to almost have a coin or, or stick your finger in. It's kind of a weird Yeah, if you don't have thing. fingernails, you can't get access to it. It's hard. Yeah. Um, another thing with this, uh, this one, in terms of the way it sits on the camera is not balanced very well compared to the other ones. And I think I've got the clip mounted correctly, but it doesn't, it doesn't look like you can put the clip in the middle. It's kind of a small detail. Yeah, and then when uh, we were first doing this setup, what was interesting to me, I'd never used this system before, was when you use this sync function, there's no feedback to see that it syncs. You just kind of hope that it syncs and say, oh yeah, okay, I'm recording audio, but it doesn't light up anything. Yeah, like the Sennheiser gives you this nice big check mark. It's like, whoa, I'm good. It didn't give anything. And on that, probably even worse than that, the thing, the real deal breaker for me, and this one's the cheapest, by the way, but the real deal breaker, and I don't understand how Shure can do this because they're a pretty good company. But from what I could see on this one, the uh, transmitter, there's no way, there's no LED. There's an LED that shows you um, that it's on, but it doesn't show you that it's over modulating or you're distorting. Um, there's no several, there's no, there's no screen like on the other ones showing you the, the level. Um, so that's kind of a real big deal breaker. Anything else that you can think of? Um, the only other piece might be that this microphone that it comes with is, is a little bit large, perhaps a little bit larger than the other ones. Harder to, harder to hide Yeah. if you're wanting to hide it. Mm -hmm. All right, next up we've got the Sennheiser. Um, James has got a lot of experience with it. Cause how, how long have you had our own, the Sennheiser? Um, I got the G3s probably two or so years ago, pretty shortly after they came out. Maybe I'm making that up, but I've had them for like two years and they've just rocked. Yeah, and I'd say in construction-wise, um, size-wise, this is definitely the winner. Um, it's got, it's got like I would call it almost like a metal case, except for the the door um, is sounds plasticky, but uh, and you know the connectors are really nice. Um, there's a little threaded adapter, um, or it threads in so it doesn't pull out. One of the really big features that I liked when I got this was the LCD screen. I'm not really an audio guy. If I can, I give that job to somebody else. But when I have to do it myself, having this LCD screen makes my life so much easier because it tells you everything you need to know. It tells you what frequency you're on. It tells you if your things are synced. It tells you what your levels are. It tells you what your battery life is. I mean, all those things are important, and it's great to have it on a screen. Yeah, I'm looking at the battery, and, and we were just talking about the mute um, feature. It has mute until you turn the other one on, and they're synced with each other, I guess. Um, then it becomes unmuted. So uh, what James was talking about before is like, what were you saying about having it in a mixer or something like that? Well, right. If you don't have it muted, then it's going to pick up weird interference. It's going to make that just like that, that kind of sound. <laughs> and if you don't have it muted, then your audio guy is like, what are you doing, man? So when you turn this on, obviously that goes away. You get a clear signal. It's nice to have that mute feature that eliminates that weird interference. Yeah, and again, construction-wise, um, I think it's got one of the best clips. Um, we had this discussion because in the manual it says you're supposed to put the, the, well, not on this one, but the actual transmitter, you're supposed to have the antennas down because the this is one antenna, but the actual mic cord itself is the other antenna. But James like, I don't like doing it that way. <laughs> I'm upright. Maybe I'm weird. I mean, And, and it works fine. I mean, distance-wise, man, you can go over 100 yards, no problem. Line of sight. I yeah. mean, the, the tricky thing yeah. with wireless is that you go around a corner, 
all bets might be off. Yeah. <laughs> now, one thing I really do like about the G3s as well is the, uh, the battery life. Uh, and we have competing brands, Duracell and Energizer, but that was totally by accident. Um, I really am impressed by the battery life on these. It's got to be six to eight hours at least uh, when you're using regular batteries. I used rechargeable at one point and they didn't really fare as well um, as much as I'm all about conserving and everything like that. It just seems like your store-bought Duracell batteries or Energizer just seem to do the job six to eight hours. Yeah, and I think, I'll put this in my show notes, but I think in the manual it does talk about eight hours for one of them. One said six, one said eight, and I can't remember which. Maybe it was the Sony that said eight, but uh, I, they're always going to be transmitting basically the same amount of power because I think there's one of these units you can do a lower power, um, but I think this one you can't choose the lower power. It's always like 30 millivolts or something like that. So. I would say that their tests that they do and they publish in the manual are probably pretty close. Yeah, no doubt. And you were going to say something about the ability to adjust not only the sensitivity of yeah, your phone. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like about this one is obviously you can, trans, you can change the preamp built into the transmitter, but unlike the other units, this is the only one where you can adjust the level on the output. Um, um, there are, the other ones do have like a headphone or a monitor out. Um, but this is one goes in 6 dB steps from like minus 30 all the way up to plus 12. So really nice feature, especially when you're trying to push as much volume as you can into the, the preamp on these uh, DSLR cameras. Uh, you want as much signal as you can. And usually actually zero works great. You don't even have to go to a plus 12 because this is the hottest output of all of them. All right, next up is the Sony. Um, I, this is a nice unit. Uh, it's got a really great distance to it, as we've seen before, and it's pretty small. It's about the same size as the Sennheiser in terms of the transmitter, but the receiver is a bit bigger. So just kind of your camera bag, you know, fitting it into your camera bag, I think the Sennheiser wins in terms of size. But build quality, it's like all metal. It's uh, really well built. Um, just tapping on it, you can tell. One of the things I don't like about it is the battery compartment. And I, we can't take it out right now. I'll show you some B-roll, but it's once you take it out, it comes all the way out. Um, putting it back in, it feels like you've seated it all the way, but you got to press in really hard to make sure it's both sides are locked. So that kind of makes me kind of nervous. What else well, can you say about the Sony? Uh, it's pretty nice unit. The distance, wow. I mean, the farthest. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always a huge feature for wireless. Um, on the downside, I don't know exactly when looking at this how to do a clear channel scan to find that open frequency it's, that's not gonna have interference. It's not as intuitive as this Sony. Yeah, I mean, you get a smaller screen, there's less information on it, and uh, I mean, it's still great. It still has a lot of information on it, but it's hard to tell, like, you know, how do I, you know, it's probably a combination of buttons or something, which is confusing when you're in the field. And one of the, the big things that I, I talked about earlier in this video was it's really tough, uh, the compression that it does is it's really, hard to set the level because um, if you crank it up too much um, and also the output level on this is much lower it's like 20 dB lower than both of the um, the other units mm -hmm. um, but so the compression wise I, I wish there was like a way to open it up a little dip switch I could turn off the compression um, in those situations where I didn't want all that background noise coming up because I was pushing everything else down um, Anything right. else? Well, and then you were saying on the transmitter, there's an additional monitor out. Oh, yes. And this is a great feature for if you're like a Canon T2i user or T3i or T4i who doesn't have a headphone out. Um, what's awesome about the Sony is it's got a, a monitor where you could put like your earbuds or headphones on and you could be listening while you're recording and you could tell when somebody is, uh, you know, starting to distort or maybe you're, you're losing signal or something like that. So it, if you've got a T2i or something like that, it doesn't have a headphone out, it's a great, um, great alternative. The only other thing I can think of with the Sony is it only has two LED uh, segments for the battery life indicator. Um, but on the other side, one of the best features, which all the other ones had this, is it's got a time remaining. So when you put a new set of batteries in, you just hit reset and it starts the clock ticking. Every time you turn it on and then it's working, it's telling you the, the elapsed time. So, this one I think has been going for like six hours, or maybe four hours actually. I think I think they're rated for six to eight hours, but it's great because you know when it's about to die. It's it's a great because when I was talking to you know James earlier, like I was asking him, how long do you typically get with the Sennheiser? And you're like, 
you know. But time. with these, <laughs> these you would actually know quite well. Yeah. All right, so before I tell you guys which one I'm going to buy, if you want to help support my site, um, just go over to B and H, and if you're interested in buying any of these uh, or anything for that matter on my gear page, just go to my gear page. There's a ton of stuff. Just click off that link, and if you go to B and H and buy something, it'll help support my site, which is helps me make more videos kind of like this, um, go really in depth kind of thing. So I'm going to go. I think it's pretty obvious. I'm going to buy the the Sennheiser. It's it's got it's the the smallest. It's I think it's got the best audio quality because the. The Sony has a little bit too much uh, sibilance in the S's. They're a bit too pronounced. You have to DS them, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> if that's the correct word, DS. I think actually it is. Um, so it, you know, best range, uh, but it is the the most expensive, unfortunately. But it's not that much more expensive than the Sony. But it is, in terms of the the Shure, it's definitely a lot more expensive. Well, I think you get the benefits from that little bit of increase in price. You get a lot of benefits. Yeah. yeah. So James, thank you very much for helping me out again. Uh, where, where can people find you? You can look me up at uh, 5kinsight.com. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you guys later. Bye.